Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and today we are going to be doing exercise number two from Interpreting Earth History by Ritter and Peterson. Alright, so exercise number two begins on page... Oh, of course I've lost the page, good work me. Begins on page 16. And as with the uh, the previous exercises, the title there, Radiogenic Ages. So what we're going to try and do with this exercise is we're going to try and use uh, uranium and lead data from uh, zircon crystals to actually try and date a sequence of rocks. We're also going to use fossil evidence to also help us to date a sequence of rocks as well. You'll be happy to know this particular lab is nice and short and relatively straightforward, so you should be able to have this one done pretty quickly. Okay, so obviously we have uh, some text there on page 16. Going on to page 17, of course, this is covering all the information that we'll be dealing with. Coming on to page 18. And then rolling over here to page 19. Okay, the lab itself doesn't actually begin until we get over here. So here is our diagram. And this diagram covers a sequence of rocks, and it's a, it's a uh, relatively simplified diagram of a sequence of rocks uh, from the uh, Uskala uh, River section. I probably pronounced that terribly wrong, but let's just roll with it for now. So what we're going to do is we're going to plot fossil evidence from layers of rock from that sequence onto the diagram. So what we have to do is this. So you'll notice that for each sample, so 13, 15, 1, 16, 1, 16, 2, 16, 3, 16, 4, okay? So those are the sample numbers. And if we come over here to the diagram, you'll see there they are again, 15, 1, 16, 1, 16, 2, 16, 3, 16, 4, 16, 5, okay? So each of the sample numbers listed on here occurs here. And for each of these samples, there is a, a set of different fossils listed. Okay, so for instance, here we have uh, S brown villainous, S simplex in 16.1, in 16.2 we have S brown villainous, in 16.3 we have S simplex and S, well, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that one. Okay, but you get the idea. So for, for each sample, there is one or more fossils listed. So what are we going to do with that information? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we are going to note the name of each of the fossils that turns up at the top of one of these lines. Now you'll notice that two of the, sorry, three of the fossils have actually been done for us already. So we're going to ignore those. Okay. So um, S. Bellis, S. Pohaskanesis, and S. Brownvillinus has already been done for us. So we're not going to worry about those fossils. So what's the next fossil in our sequence? Well, S. Ballas has been done, S. Pohans, S. Pohans, uh, Huskinesis has been done, excuse my terrible pronunciation, S. Brown Villainous, okay, S. Simplex is going to be the next fossil. All right, so I'm going to take my pen out, and at the top of the line, I'm just going to make a note for S. Simplex in my best terrible handwriting. All right, so S. Simplex occurs in sample 16.1. Okay, so on the diagram, I'm going to find sample 16.1, which is here. I'm going to come across and I'm going to put a circle on my diagram to show that S simplex occurs there. All right, I'm going to go back to the data. I'm going to say, right, does S simplex appear again? Well, yes, it does. 16-3. Now, from that point on, S simplex doesn't appear again in the sequence. So 16-3, 16-3, come across, there. Okay, and so that's the range for S simplex. So S simplex occurs between those two points. And then I'm just going to simply draw a line, link them together, just like we have done, just like they've done on these ones here. Okay, so for each different fossil species, you're going to write its name at the top here and you're going to use a circle to mark out each layer that it occurs in and you're going to link all those circles together with a line okay to be clear 
if the fossil occurs in more than two layers, you are going to draw more than two circles. Okay, don't just draw a circle for when it first appears and when it last appears. Draw every, a circle for every single layer that it appears in. Okay, what well, you're asking yourself, well, hold on a minute. Well, why is that actually important to me? Well, if we just go to the previous page. And have a look for a second. It makes a rather important uh, piece, of, or gives us a rather important piece of information. Here we go. The Carboniferous Permian boundary is defined by the first occurrence of the conodont species S. isolatus. Okay, so when S. isolatus makes its first appearance in our sequence of rocks, that tells us we have transitioned from the Carboniferous into the Permian. So this is the power of fossils. It's essentially using the fossils we can actually find out where the boundary falls in our sequence of rocks. So that's rather helpful and we do that of course by noting where each fossil occurs in the sequence. I'm terribly sorry, I'm getting really out of whack. We, we, uh, yeah. we mark out the occurrence for each fossil sequence and of course when S. isolatus is marked out the first time that S. isolatus appears that is where the Carboniferous Permian boundary sits. Okay so that's the power of fossils. So what about numerical dating? Well in the case of numerical dating we are going to go to page 22. So this is using a mineral in this case zircon crystals to produce numerical ages an actual number. So remember, if we're just using the fossils, that's not giving us a number. That's just simply saying, right, when S. isolatus first appears, that's the boundary. There's no number involved. There's no date. If we actually want to get a date, we have to use radiometric dating methods. Okay. And if you remember, if you've seen the lecture, you will know that for minerals like zircon, the preferred technique is using uranium lead dating. Now, I'm not going to go into the, the basics of how uranium lead dating works because, once again, you should have watched the lecture. If you, don't, if you haven't watched the lecture yet, please watch the lecture before you do this. So, if we look, we can see we have several layers of bentonite in our sequence. So, if we go back to our diagram here, you will notice we have several layers that are marked out by these orange lines. So, A, B, C, D, E, etc. Now, these represent layers of volcanic ash that have been altered later to give us the mineral bentonite, but nevertheless, they are originally volcanic layers, and within those volcanic layers, there are zircons, and we can date those zircons. And so what we have here, at the bottom of page 22, is we have a table, and this table gives us zircon data from five selected layers, E, F, G, I, 18-4. So if we go back, E, F, G, H. Oh no, I got my numbers wrong. No, we didn't want it. We wanted E, F, G, and I. Ooh, there we go. E, F, G, and I. Ignore H, it's not important. And 18-4. Okay. So what are we going to do with these? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to calculate the sample average. So we, what we have here are a number of pieces of data. And these pieces of data represent uranium lead ratios. Okay, so the hard work has already been done for you. You don't really need to do many calculations at all. So what you are going to do is you're going to take these pieces of data, one, two, three, four, five, six, you're going to add all those six pieces of data together, then you're going to divide by six to give you the average. In the case of this column, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you're going to add these nine pieces of data together and then divide by nine to get you the average. Relatively straightforward. Okay, so we're doing well so far, so we're going to note our averages in those four boxes there. You'll notice that the average for date, uh, bed 18-4 has already been done for us. So, great. Okay. 
So next we need to do is we need to come up with an approximate age for each of the beds. And in order to do that, we're going to use figure 2.6. So figure 2.6 are these graphs right here. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate our average ages. Oh, excuse me, boring myself. <clears throat> so let's assume, for argument's sake, that an average for the average for layer E just happened to be 0 0.04750. So this point right here. Okay. Well, how are we going to use that? Well, what we would do we would take our ruler hasn't made an appearance as exercise 11 but it's making a comeback now we would draw a line coming from 0 0.4750 so our line is going to come across until we hit this diagonal line when we hit the diagonal line we are going to turn and we're going to draw a line downwards and so if our sample gave a, gave a sample average of 0. 4750 that equates to an age of 299 million years or 299.2 million years that's how it's done that's simple okay so for each of these five samples you're going to produce an average and then using the graphs on the next page you're going to produce an age and you're going to write the ages in here okay now to be clear, samples E, F, G, and I, they are going to plot on this diagram down here. Sample 18-4 on the other hand is going to plot on this diagram up here. So don't get caught out by that. All right, so we're doing pretty well so far. We've calculated our ages and we've then used those ages to come up with, sorry, we've calculated the averages, I do apologize, and we've then used those averages to come up with an age for each of the five layers. Brilliant. Okay, so question three. Do the radiometric ages make sense stratigraphically? Well, what would you expect to see? Well, if we go back to our diagram here, if we're looking at this from a purely stratigraphic point of view, we would expect A to be the oldest, and we would expect I or 18-4 up here to be the youngest. That's what we would expect stratigraphically. So does the data that we've collected show that? That's the first question. So in theory, E should be the oldest and 18-4 should be the youngest. Is that what we see? If it's not what we see, why is that? Well, I just want to draw your attention just to one thing and I want to make this clear to you. If we just have a look at what we have here, we'll see that all of these, so A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I, those are all volcanic ash beds. And we know the volcanic ash beds because it tells us so in the key down here at the bottom. 18-4, on the other hand, is not a volcanic ash bed. It's a sandstone. So you have to think about what the nature of a sandstone is. What is a sandstone made up of? Okay. And that's going to help you answer this question. All right, then we come over here to question four. So use the relationship shown in figure 2.3. So figure 2.3 is this figure right here. Remember, we will have loads of circles on here because we will have done the circles for each of the fossils. Each row, of course, representing just one fossil. Uh, where are we? And we have the isotopic data that we've calculated using the table down here. So what we need to do is we need to calculate the age of the Carboniferous Permian boundary. And we're going to suggest an absolute age. Now, what's going to happen when we do this is you're going to find that you have been tremendously lucky. And you're going to find that when you look at the first appearance of S. isolatus, which of course, remember, is used to mark out the Carboniferous Permian boundary. Let's say for argument, say that S. isolatus falls here. Okay, and so that's layer 16-5. Let's say that's the first time S. isolatus appears. Well, it just so happens that we are super lucky. We have a date for F and we have a date for G, don't we? 
So essentially we've bracketed that layer. We have a, a lower limit and an upper limit for the age of 16-5. So brilliant, everything is going our way super well, isn't it? So how are we going to use that data to produce an absolute age? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to quite simply take the middle point between the dates we get for F and the dates we get for G. And so we're going to take F and G, add those, num add those two ages together, then divide by two, and then that's going to be our absolute age in millions of years. And that's it. So you'll see exercise two is a nice, straightforward exercise, not too much to do. You should be able to get through it with practically no trouble whatsoever. But once again, if you do have any issues, you can contact me about it during office hours at the allotted time. All right. Have a good day, guys.